With cloud or clouds now being the destination for so many workloads, it can feel like we're starting to lose control. Accurate or not, that's not a feeling that security people like to experience, and it's certainly not something to leave unaddressed. I mean, there can be a dangerous assumption that cloud-based environments are just too complex and confusing to get the, the visibility and the control that you need to run your operation the way you want to. Well, every cloud service has a different set of often confusing options. It can sound like what you need, but still leave you with that feeling that, well, something, something is missing. So what is the right way to handle security when it comes to the cloud? And we've tackled several important cloud topics as outlined in the Worldwide Technology Research Report Cloud Priorities for 2023. It's a must read. Two of the four listed here, optimization and edge, can be accessed in replay right away, or at least wait till you finish this show. But for today, we are covering cloud security with Clint Huffaker. Hey, thanks, Rob. Good to see you. Clint brings over 20 years of experience in routing, switching, and security, plus application delivery controllers and services. He spent numerous hours educating people like us on the importance of getting this stuff right. He's our special guest today as we dive into cloud security. Welcome to Tech 37, your home for technology, education, and collaboration from worldwide technology. My name is Rob Boyd. Who are you? What do you do for Worldwide? Uh, Quinn Huffaker. I'm a practice manager on our global security team, uh, focused primarily on uh, application security, API security, and kind of on into workload security and in, uh, in the cloud as well. Well, awesome. Well, you're you're perfect for this this next deep dive we've got today, where I've called upon you, or we've called upon you to to say how do we address this cloud security as a priority that was called out in cloud priorities. Security obviously important, I think, with anyone's priority list, uh, no matter what the subject but specifically to cloud. And so I'm wondering, how should we even think about this? Because I feel like we've been on this move of push everything to cloud, but how do we push things, everything to cloud, but do that in a secure manner? What's the balancing act we need to keep in mind here? It's a common challenge, right? I mean, customers are, you know, really looking through, it's it's an, a balance between innovation and customer experience versus, you know, security and really trying to figure out their appetite for risk. Um, I think one of the things that's greatly changing is is really the role of accountability, right? I mean, that that accountability is kind of coming up the stack where it is has kind of always been at that CISO level, but now it's going above there. You know, even, you know, people talking about going to the board level for accountability. So I think it's going to change, you know, the market a little bit and help help organizations ultimately define that balancing act a little bit more. Um, you know, one of the first things that, that we really look at from a direction in, in cloud conversations is ultimately it's really starts is is your industry or vertical or what however you want to refer to that is where are they really aligned on governance risk and compliance right you have to understand those things is like the key factor and and ultimately why are you doing what you're doing right if you can't answer why then the question is why <laughs> and 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 ultimately it kind of comes down to you know what and who is ex accepting you know the data and what are the applications and access and where where are they kind of rolling back and forth whether they're living in cloud or they're on prem but ultimately it kind of rolls down into really understanding access control and permissions and really being able from a data side being able to model that data and know you know what applications are using it why are they using it how are they using it um, and, and ultimately think about visibility, right? Visibility is always a major challenge in the public cloud, but it's also a challenge on-prem in many cases. Um, so ultimately, if you kind of look through, you know, that lens, then you come into the time and money aspect, right? How much time is it going to take us to do this? How much money is involved from a, a data perspective, right? It's, it's very expensive to move data. Uh, in the cloud, right? So you kind of want to hit it right the first time, um, but but ultimately considering in motion uh, security, uh, at rest security, and really the access patterns. But now a major player in the market is really coming back to the heuristics of that and using AI and ML um, and out of bound controls to kind of help model security uh, mm -hmm. per se. But ultimately driving towards you know in band controls like CASB or DLP. Um, and other security controls there as well. I would say, you know, one other area is to really have structure around data because right, even though it's replicated for many times for disaster recovery purposes, is you look through that 
and they don't, there hasn't been a lot of structure, you know, right. data owners weren't always identified. There were no data stewards, permissions and rights and access and, you know, replicated data was just kind of crazy across the, the estate. Um, and we're actually starting to see a lot more control around that now, um, mm -hmm. especially as, you know, customers look to migrate to the cloud. One common criteria I know I've used throughout my career and many security experts do is, you know, really considering the three-legged tool of like the CAA triad, right, to where regardless of, of where your applications and data live or what the balance may be, that CIA triad can really be kind of used as a model, you know, ultimately to come back and give you a checklist to ensure that everything is there from a confidentiality standpoint, from an availability standpoint, from integrity, and kind of looking through that, if you think of, you know, gravity and, and gold, right? Data, data and applications are really the new gold, more data, but if you think about the size of assets for digital organizations today, regardless of what industry they're in, the data they have and the applications that create revenue are the largest assets that organizations have today. Let so me, let me pause you talking, there for one. Don't yeah. pause you there for one second, because so in case anybody's not familiar with the CIA triad, I think it's something we all know from a security perspective. But if if we've got some cloud professionals looking to update security, how do you define that? You called a little bit of the elements out, but what's important there? Yeah. So, well, first, we shouldn't confuse it with the Central Intelligence Agency in the U.S. government. Great point. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Good when you say that. CIA, many people think of that, right? But I think from from that standard or model, it's, you know, confidentiality is really ensuring that your data is secure, it's kept secret, it's private, and you're really mm -hmm. thinking about access control, authorization, data classification, um, and, and privileges, right, to really kind of find in who should have access to this data appropriately, right? That the wrong yeah. permissions aren't set leading to, you know, a data breach uh, because an S3 bucket or something like that is left exposed. The next thing comes down to the I for integrity, right? Is that data trustworthy, free from okay. tampering? Can it be changed? Who changed it? When did they change it? Um, you know, really to make sure that it's authentic um, and real. And then, you know, as you look through and you kind of get into that API and application stack is you can also talk about uh, business logic abuse, right? Of how mm. did they change that data or that code as it was promoted into production, right? So there's that whole component. And then you kind of ultimately come down into availability, right? So now you're talking about purely available data and applications to where it's really driving in a very hot topic today. Uh, cyber resilience, right? Really yeah. protecting against ransomware, ensuring that that data is available at all times. What is it protected and how is it protected from DDoS threats? Uh, and then also the disaster recovery side, right? So the, okay. the ultimate goal and focus around the CIA triad is to help, you know, customers and organizations really identify vulnerabilities and gaps or flaws in an architecture to then give them a model to make sure that those assets are secured uh, yeah. around a common theme. Does that kind of make sense? It, it does. And I was, as I'm thinking, I'm glad you started with some things that I would kind of throw in the bucket of just good everlasting security principles that sound like they're still very much applicable to the cloud environment. We're starting to talk about data gravity. Um, can you explain that concept and, and where does that become important to understand here? So ultimately, if you, if you think about data, um, you know, data has mass, right? And the greater the mass, the more likely applications and services are attracted to us. If you bring that back to like very legacy uh, infrastructures and, and operations is many times we were running on a hub and spoke type network architecture, right? So yeah. the data, everything was coming back to the data centers. That's where the applications and the web servers and everything lived, right? So the, the core tenets behind that were because there was concern around latency. There was obvious concerns around security. Um, and ultimately, as public cloud kind of became a thing, right, the the perception uh, or in the lack of knowledge around public cloud and kind of that ecosystem really created, you know, early on a lot of friction. Um, people were concerned about third party data stores versus on prem, um, you know, and, and ultimately there were trust boundaries to say, yeah. no way I'm putting my data out in a public cloud. Right. So, and, and then there's also the argument of governance and compliance, but there's also you know, kind of to backtrack a little bit is to go back to like that lack of maturity, right, around the data. So if you kind of look at that, today's applications and workloads are extremely distributed, right? Endpoints are everywhere mm -hmm. as are threat actors. And ultimately, that's kind of driving the industry forward to really look for what, what you know, we would say is we need data reform, 
right? We need Ooh, interesting. Uh, governance right. and compliance around the protection of data, kind of like GDPR, right? But we need yeah. that across the masses everywhere to prevent breach. Um, and, and ultimately, one of the directions that, that my practice and our global, global cybersecurity team is really focusing on is to build adaptive architectures that are ready to consume whatever comes their way, whether that's a new regulation or that is a new acquisition um, or anything. It's really understanding to say, hey, this is a dynamic architecture that can take anything that comes at it and absorb it and move on, right? That allows businesses to move faster, make decisions faster, and really move on into production uh, at a much, much quicker pace. And I think, it, you know, ultimately it really drives down to, you know, data is being produced absolutely everywhere. And again, yeah. that comes back to why are you doing what you're doing? How are you consuming it? Who's consuming it? So if you really think about, you know, from a data standpoint, all the data that goes into the cloud is think of all the house, the houses around you, the cars, the cell phones, your TV, all the smart devices, right? If you put into context and think about how many devices are there within, this, within a, a one mile radius of me, and now multiply mm -hmm. that across the earth. I yeah. mean, the, the scale at which data is being produced is absolutely incredible. And most yeah. of it is purely for analytics. It's to increase and, and gain customer experience. It's for rewards. Um, you know, you think of all the video that, that our Arlo cameras or whatever in our homes are producing, 99.8% of that video is never reviewed, yeah, right? True. So it's first in, first out, right? So it just rolls. Um, but ultimately, it kind of leads you down into best practices around managing your data when it comes to an enterprise level you know, really drives towards setting, setting goals, right? Define the goals yeah. of the project, define the goals of the data, um, mm -hmm. and really look at, you know, deciding what data sets benefit from being moved to the cloud and why they would benefit from that. Um, you know, you get into automating data protection policies to know that it may be more restrictive um, as you go in. And then how do you change it to ensure that all of your, your permissions and rights and privileged access are all set accordingly? Um, so we don't come across more breaches or I guess enable the, the possibility and increase risk for a breach. Yeah, um, I mean, because what you're talking about too, though, is you're saying there's so much data, it's increasing rapidly. So the objective can't be that we apply the same high level of security control to all data. We mm -hmm. need to we need to understand our data, combine that with our objectives, where we want to go, our why, I think, as you worded it earlier. But then the notion is, is, okay, so if we know our data, then we're going to wrap specific controls at some stage of the processes that that data is going to go through. And that becomes important to kind of define what those are, because theoretically, we there's no limit to how much you could invest in security. But obviously, no one's right. really got an unlimited budget. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's never a, a one size fits all approach. Yeah. And that, that's okay. not even between customers, that's between the applications and the data, right? Is you're, you may treat this set of data differently than this set because they have different yeah. uses. There's different whys behind that, right? And, and I think if you really roll that back, the long-term strategy for data may be different than the short-term strategy. Things will change. We know that. Right. So again, that kind of comes back to that adaptive architecture to say, if we slow down, assess what we need to do, understand the why, set the compliance and set everything around what we're doing and what those drivers are, we can put a better model together to say, this is how we're going to move that data to the cloud and why, uh, you know, because if you really think about it, um, you know, people, they're always the weakest link. Right. Yeah. And, and we're human. And things yeah. are going to happen. So that's where if you can get into automation and policy as code and kind of infrastructure as code, and you can really accelerate everybody, you know, all the way from the network into the data, if you can control that and minimize human error, you can minimize risk, right? So if you look through that, and then that's where security tools and the cloud security ecosystem, you know, from whether it's a, a workload protection or security posture management tools or whatever, there are absolutely tools out there that are very defined to essentially limit the possibility of those things, but to also track and audit and essentially report on them so you can mitigate that risk before things, you know, fully go into production. When we talk about cloud and this pace of adoption, how has that changed kind of the security mindset or the approach or maybe even the the call to action, the urgency of, of mm -hmm. providing security answers, because I don't think we're slowing the data down and I don't think there's a pause button. So what do you recommend? <laughs> yeah, to, it's important there. I mean, think about this for a moment. Gene Kim said the ratio of engineers and development 
operations and infosec in a typical technology company is a hundred to 10 to one. So that's development is a hundred. And then you're saying operations is 10 and yep. then one 10 is the infosec. infosec. So this is what people are yeah. trying to run their operation with that type of ratio. So vastly yeah, outnumbered that, security professionals and security functions. Exactly. And that, you uh -huh. know, the, the, that's a scary thought, right? A very upside down ratio, not completely upside down, but it's scary, you know, not to helpful. say the least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we were, you know, recently on a customer call with a financial uh, services customer and he kind of chuckled and he said, I wish my ratio was that. He said, I'm, oh. we're, we're probably more three to 400 to 10 to one. Oh my. Right. Okay. So, so if you think about all of the apps that are being developed, how fast they're being developed and pushed into production, all the data that's being generated behind that and, and consumed to one InfoSec guy, right. Or growl, you know, so you kind of look at that and it seems out of balance. And it's the number that's accelerating the most too. So it's going to continue to create additional imbalance if we don't have something that can kind of latch onto that growth. But you were telling me about a, a, your family moving around a lot and that you saw some parallels to kind of help understand what was important in this area. Can you uh, eliminate on that a little bit further? Yeah. So uh, it's kind of funny, actually starting with worldwide uh, technology. When I started here, once taking that role uh, worldwide, I was a CSE in the field um, working out of Kansas city that that started our move process, right. From state to state. And, you know, we recently built a new home, finally moved uh, what we're hoping is the final time for the fifth time in six years um, yeah. for numerous reasons. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this conversation and ultimately I was like, man, it's almost like moving, right. Is there's multiple options. You can either do the quick move where it's throw everything in boxes and lift and shift. You're literally taking it to the cloud. You don't know Which why means you're, you're kind of dealing with it later, right? <laughs> you're like, I yeah, don't know yeah, where yeah. we put the dishes. Are they in the same box as the, the games from the living room? You know, I don't yes. know. Yes. Yeah, it's the exact same principle, right? Okay. So if you bring that logic down, it's kind of like we can take everything, right? And then sort it out later, right? After a breach. Now we have to sort out and figure out where is it? Why is it? How did it happen? You know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Or you can be more methodical and say, hey, we're going to pack room by room and identify the dependencies of this application to understand the why, you know, what data is it accessing and who's accessing it and why are they accessing it, right? So you can be more methodical and ultimately save time in the end um, and be yeah. much more organized. You, if you do that and you build a security program around uh, around cloud and around data, mm -hmm. ultimately you're, you can absolutely reduce risk. Um, you can potentially minimize cost. Um, it gives you the ability to really prioritize um, of what you're doing and to create a program around the migration and journey, right? That's what everything is about today. The one thing that I would say is, you know, greatly changing in the industry right now is we're taking a lot of silos that used to exist between network and security and developers and so on. And you've probably heard the, the, the term, you know, DevSecOps or shift left mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And, and ultimately that's, that's creating a culture. Right. It's it's in many cases putting security first. But the more important thing is it's tearing down silos and allowing people to work together um, to really create a security program that is cohesive and all inclusive across the entire estate um, so they can work together to formulate security policies and have SLAs in, in place, you know, for applications that don't meet minimum requirements. So we're no longer accelerating and looking at the runtime side of security so much, even though we are still are monitoring that, it shouldn't be that those tools are working overtime because we're deploying bad code or vulnerable yeah. code. Yeah. So we really have to, you know, kind of shift left. That's what that whole mentality is about is get everything sooner in the development life cycle, test the code, test the underlying components of the code that it's writing upon from an infrastructure standpoint. Are there vulnerabilities there? And okay do not allow it to go to production or to go into staging without that being fixed. Right. And identify it. Now you're bringing back accountability. Yeah. Um, so ultimately it's bringing security closer to the business. And is that, is it feasible to do that in a cost effective manner? I mean, I know that in the long run, cause it's always the hard part is we know that I think everybody agrees. Yeah. Security is much less expensive. If you implement it early, it's become increasingly important. It feels like to understand, well, are those things that we did in the shift left methodology actually holding you know, holding their own in deployment. And do we have a cycle for saying it, there's a communication that needs to happen there in a circular fashion uh, to address 
runtime vulnerabilities, it, it maybe is one example. If you talk about the shift left, shift right, um, you know, one of the coin terms that the WWT is using right now, and I absolutely love it, not only because of the marketing side of it, but it's, it is just absolutely spot on, is to automate everything right, right? I mean, stop and think about that. You can automate things, but you got to do them right. Otherwise, it brings up another topic. As you look as you look towards DevSecOps or shifting left, right? We are everybody's about accelerating the business. How can we deploy applications faster? How can we get it into production faster? So on and so forth. But what is the common theme facing security organizations for the past 20 years? It's security was always the gate holder. Right. Yeah. They were always yeah. that slow down. They <laughs> were always guys. the last to know, you know, if you look at that. So it's like, well, let's accelerate the business and get applications deployed faster. But like you're creating a more of a funnel and a backlog for the security and infrastructure teams. Right. So now that's bringing in security automation. Right. Is that policy is code? Is it infrastructure is code? Is it DevSecOps? Right. So now one of the, the modern things, as much as we say, like DevSecOps is still in kind of infancy stages for many. We're, mm -hmm. we're having a lot of conversations around building programs for DevSecOps, but now we're evolving to the companies who have been doing DevSecOps. Now they're looking at platform engineering, right? And okay. that's where I believe, you know, and, and, you know, through conversations I'm having with experts across the in industry is really how do we fold all of these security tools and all of these security checks into the CI CD pipeline through platform engineering to give them an automated way to get self-service to yeah have the security, you know, vulnerabilities checked and know that everything is there. So the runtime security side is much faster. It can be even a, a lower level policy because we don't need to be looking for things that we know are fixed in the code version, right? So as you go from staging and, uh -huh. and into production, you're fixing things much earlier and raising awareness to the problems before they ever even make it to production. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm thinking that the automation becomes important. In, in, a, in one sense, it feels like it's driving towards something I've always believed in, which is security needs to remain as invisible as possible. And developers, I think, when they're under the pressure of turning out code and checking it in, and they're maybe even incentivized to get it out quickly, suddenly they view security as something that if it if it's not automatically happening and or potentially, you know, being inserted into the process relatively invisibly, if not completely, then you run the risk of them skipping that step to hit their objectives, unless, of course, you've got security objectives tied to that, too, which I think is a good practice. But yeah, no, it does make sense. And it also it feels like that becomes increasingly important now when we've got shared libraries and we've got um, uh, modular code that's been developed somewhere else. And, you know, we're just simply sharing vulnerabilities of unknown origin potentially in these environments in our need to increase the velocity and keep up the pace, so to speak. So that automation that inserts itself there becomes more important. Yeah. Yeah, no, you, you just you hit on so many key things there. Um, you know, we're, we're talking with so many different vendors around about around kind of the whole, you know, software bill of materials really started in kind of the the federal space, right, of understanding what are all the underlying components of your applications? What are they running on? Um, so really thinking about uh, it's kind of like, you know, going to bake a cake. Right. But you look at the ingredient list and find out all the minute details of, of, of what's in that cake mix. Right. Yeah. That's essentially what a, a software bill of materials or SBOM is. Right. Okay. Super hot topic right now. Um, and it's actually bleeding over into the enterprise space as well because of third party risk. Right. So another thing that you mentioned there that I think is really important as you look through migrating to the cloud, um, you, you start thinking of service level objectives. Right. Okay. Um, and, and ultimately that is, that is a definitive balance that can help with certain policies and, and guidelines set. There are tools out there that essentially look through, you know, how many incidents, um, are we seeing with our applications? Uh, how many vulnerabilities are we seeing once they're in production, so on and so forth. So you have this entire backlog of projects that you have to work on as a developer, right? But if you start to see an increase in customer inquiries, be, you know, coming in through the help desk that things aren't working correctly, your service level objectives will shift that balance and say, stop production on innovation and go fix what's in production. Oh, right? interesting. And so it's almost a forced rebalancing. Yeah. It, exactly. So there are now tools that are looking at that from an analytic side um, and really monitoring kind of the help desk side of the yeah. world to to ensure service level objectives for that as well. What does a program look like? Because I think I'm walking away from this and this would be the assumption I think you'd want me to have, which is we don't want to we're not going to throw up our hands and go, I can't handle this. It's too much complexity. 
you've yeah. dealt with this a lot with with getting people in a programmatic mindset. So how does that work? What does that kind of look like? Can you paint some broad strokes? You know, one of the biggest benefits, um, greatest benefits of cloud is the ability to let teams to move faster in development, right? Kind of bringing everybody together, building down silos. And ultimately, as we look through that program, and, and this is what we're helping a lot of customers with from the consulting side is really folding security in, right? Mm -hmm. Get it into the development process, get in the automation initiatives and really remove a lot of that friction. That's what it's, that's what's improving the velocity. Right. And okay. it's like changing the tires on a car while it's moving. Um, you know, you kind of get that, you, you, you move through that. And the best cybersecurity programs, you know, that we're seeing, again, they're adaptive. They anticipate what is to come. They build a program around it and they adapt the business demands to threats quickly. Right. So that's kind of where you're looking at instead of like, uh, you know, pure anti antivirus, for instance, you're looking at detection and response. Right. So you, you really kind of acknowledge your past flaws. Um, that came with what you were doing, you learn from it. And, and cybersecurity ultimately has to transform in a big way, a lot because A, they're kind of in the limelight because of all the breaches and increased security awareness um, that's really coming down. But but also because the the accountability factor, right? Now that now the accountability is going beyond the CISO. Um, yeah. So you, you really have to kind of pull it in and allow for more budget and development and runtime security, quantify your risk, and build resilient architectures that adapt to security into the business. And I assume that programmatically speaking, you can be in control of your destiny here. So even if you're in what most of us are in a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environment, you have the ability to build tools that are gonna extract the fact that you have two different cloud providers that have different ways of presenting data to you perhaps, or feeding back uh, you know, the information that you need, but yet I assume tools exist that I can remain in control of that says, this is what my situation looks like. This is how my process is unfolding, regardless of maybe where my data is, is being uh, actually processed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, you know, visibility is key. And, yeah, okay. and we are seeing a major increase um, from customers really looking for not only the visibility aspect, but the consistency is they yeah. know it's a true problem. If I'm going to multi-cloud, I can't use, you know, three different tools because I want to go into that cloud native space and use those. I mean, testing in our ATC has absolutely shown that, that the best case tools for security are still generally almost always going to be third party. Right. Okay. Not to say there are not tools in native cloud that are a perfect fit for that. We can absolutely yeah. help map to that uh, when and where it makes sense. But mm -hmm. consistency and having the same policies and the same frameworks and the same level of visibility and monitoring and control across multi cloud, even into the on prem, is it's imperative uh, to really lead this the whole automation DevSecOps, you know, kind of culture because now you have feature functionality parity across all multi cloud and environments. Yeah. Well, because as they say, I think you have to sign off on this. I remember at least with AWS is, hey, guys, this is your responsibility. Just because we're taking care of your data doesn't mean that we are held. Yeah. They have no responsibility for what happens to it. And it, it really and hopefully that's obvious to everybody. But I do think we had gone through an early mind shift where we just like we set it and forget it with cloud. And your security guys are like, no, it's still your data and it's still valuable to you. <laughs> you can't hand that off or just suddenly think that you've successfully um, you know, put the proverbial insurance policy on it and made it someone else's problem. It is still your problem. But Clint, yep. great stuff. Obviously, the security priorities seem to have no end. They're in every element here. And I appreciate you <laughs> taking the time to, to share your insights with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. This has been a good discussion. Look forward to talking again. And a well-functioning cloud security program requires multiple layers of security standards, all of which aim to protect digital assets. This means security from the code all the way to the data which includes traditional infrastructure, security, data security, operations, as well as automation. Now here's a six point cloud security checklist that you can reference as we end things here. Enable culture shifts that drive top down alignment as well as user empowerment. Consolidate, update and replace security tools across your organization. You need to feature repeatable and scalable processes rooted in security fundamentals and aligned with business goals need to shift security left, like we've talked about, enabling application development with security top of mind. And of course, automate everything right. Embrace zero trust, meaning that you know your assets, your data, and your permissions around that data. Now, I took this list, to be fair, straight out of the cloud priorities for 2023, as that's the document that inspired this entire show, and I encourage you to read it. 
WWT has so many resources to help smooth out your journey, and they're ready to assist you with as little or as much help as you may require. All you got to do is ask. Hey, my name is Rob Boyd. I want to thank you for watching Tech 37.